Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Climate Now Live here on Euronews YouTube channel. My name's Jeremy Wilkes, and today we're talking about whether 2023 is going to be the hottest year ever. Let's bring up this graph. Just have a look at that red line on the right hand side. It is shocking and astounding climate scientists. We're going to be talking to them about what's going on. And we're also going to be talking about what we're going to do about it. Have a look at this photo. Are we going to end up like these school children hiding from the heat in Paris last week in a simulation of the city at 50 degrees? We'll be talking more about that too. So let's get to our guests and please send in your questions on the chat. Thank you for the questions we've already received. We're talking to Dr. Samantha Burgess, the Deputy Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service. Hello, Sam. Hi there. Dr. Zachary Lave, the climate scientist at Princeton University. Hi, Zach. Thanks for getting up early for this. Hello. Dr. Lucy Hubble-Rose, the Deputy Director of the UCL Climate Action Unit. Hello, Lucy. Hello. And Alexandre Florentin, a Green Party MP and President of Paris at 50 Degrees. Thanks for Hello. being with us. Hello. Thank you. Let's go back to that graph that we just showed. Let's just have a look at that. Sam, Everybody was shocked when they saw this. The science community was going mad on Twitter. What did you think when you saw that? When you saw 2023 shooting up on the right-hand side there at the global surface air temperature anomaly for September? Yeah, so we were watching the anomalies or the, the margin that September was above uh, the, the rest of September's that we've observed. And so throughout the month, we were watching with um, quite a lot of surprise how how large that margin was above any uh, other month. And by the end of the month, when we did the analysis, we could show that September 2023 was not only the warmest September on record globally, but it was the, the biggest marginal difference between any other month of any year in our data record going back to 1940. So that was a, a really unprecedented result. What was kind of in your uh, in your heart, in your guts, I suppose, when you saw that? Um, I guess it makes me nervous about what's to come. And when we look at the data for October, we see that the, the anomalies are incredibly strong. Uh, so October is going to be much, much warmer than the average period for the last 30 years. Uh, so we, we have you know 11 days to go uh, to determine how much larger that red line will be on the right hand side of the graph for October. But when we combine all the data together, so the global air temperature records, the global sea surface temperature records, where we've seen more heat than ever before, the global uh, sea ice records, where we see the lowest sea ice that we've ever seen before. All of these indications together really tell us that our climate is changing at a very rapid pace and we have to adapt to the climate that we're facing right now. Um, Zach Leib, is this something that surprised you or is it kind of what we were expecting when we see the figures for September and overall for 2023? I think what was very surprising to me this year has been the persistence so climate scientists have been expecting that 2023 would be a very warm year, partially due to the long-term human-caused climate trend, but also due to the formation of El Nino, which is this warming of the Pacific Ocean, which tends to bring a lot of warmth around the world. However, I have been surprised by, again, the persistence of how large these deviations have been. It was not only September, but also August and July also observed very large deviations. And as you can see here, there is a long-term trend. So I'm used to as a climate scientist saying that this month is a new record high. But again, the, the deviation compared to any previous record is what's really surprising and that what we're all really trying to disentangle to find out what are the causes. It's interesting, yeah, that you're talking about the size of the anomaly because that was very striking. And me, somebody who's been covering this closely for uh, well, since 2019 on a monthly basis um, in Climate Now on Euronews. And seeing that anomaly number, particularly for Europe, I mean, we had a 2.5 degree anomaly here in, in Europe. It was like, well, we've never reported a number like that before. It's 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.9 maybe when it's, when it's you know, a big anomaly. It wasn't what we were expecting at all. Um, it does lead to a lot of speculation, Sam, about whether 2023 is going to be the hottest year on record. Where do you stand on that at the moment? 
Yeah, so we can say with uh, a virtual certainty that 2023 will be the warmest year on record. Um, as Zach mentioned, we had the warmest June on record, the warmest July, which is all, also the warmest month the world has ever seen in recent history, the warmest August, which was the second warmest month, and now the warmest September. Um, so, yeah, all of these, uh, this long term trend combined really um, shows that 2023 is a, a year that um, is increasing these long term trends where we're seeing this heat generated across the system. And, and this is uh, edging out the previous warm years from 2016 and 2020 when we had those strong El Nino events and El Ninos bring up that global temperature. Lucy, can I come to you and just ask for your perspective on some of the climate data that you're seeing in the last couple of months or so? You work at the Climate Action Unit at, at UCL. What are the kind of conversations you're having there around these figures and the, what, the changes that we see at the moment? So it becomes ever more important for us to think about how we support policymakers and how we support individuals and organisations to help change to happen. The, these numbers are... are um, are not, I mean, they're, uh, as it's been said, they're, they're extremely surprising uh, in, the, in the, the, the sense of the, the scale of the anomaly. But I won't speak to the climate science because we have the experts here to do that. I can only speak to the fact that, that, that this signal is even more of a need for action. Uh, but we know that that in itself uh, isn't necessarily, that the difference in temperatures that we're seeing isn't necessarily going to be enough to move people to action. Yeah, we're going to get to talking to you about how we try and move the, the scale of action and accelerate that later on in this. Um, Alexandre, you're a politician um, and you're inside Paris Town Hall headquarters and you're talking to fellow politicians, I'm sure, as well. What do you think that the politicians are taking on this, this data on a regular basis and understanding it and reacting to it? Um, unfortunately, the do not listen enough uh, what uh, the, the brilliant scientists uh, are telling us and they are telling this for a very long time. And I think there is a huge misunderstanding regarding one specific point, which is that um, climate change is something that only goes forward. And every time I'm, uh, I have the opportunity to talk publicly, I remind the, the, uh, the, the people that um, we nobody will ever experience anymore the kind of summers that they experienced when they were kids so it at best it can kind of stops where we are right now so um and i i find i found out that very little people understand this um and it's um, in my me, experience, Alexandre, I, yes. I say that to them. They don't like hearing it very much, do they? They when I say we're not going back to the climate of my youth in the 1970s or 80s, they don't like it. No, they don't like it. But um, well, it's the truth. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I love this sentence from a, a scientist in a rebellion. Uh, Tell the truth. Otherwise, um, if you I think it was Desmond Tutu who said that uh, the only way to, uh, um, to, to act is actually to, to face reality as it is. Um, and uh, I've used that sentence as well as a, an English saying that goes, um, hope for the best, plan for the worst. Um, I don't think there's an equivalent in French, but I was using this uh, uh, to actually convince people around me to accept that we need to think about Paris at 50 degrees and look at it very, very thoroughly. And I, what I found out is that um, it was a much better call for action. Um, mm. Let's face it, nobody really cares about polar bears, uh, the Antarctic or uh, Pakistanis and floods uh, in other places around the world. However, uh, in a place like Paris where we, we had uh, quite a huge amount of, uh, uh, de um, a, a, quite a death toll, uh, because of heat waves uh, in the previous years, um, it's a good call for action to actually talk about climate change through heat waves in the city. And when you look at it very thoroughly, then you found out that, wow, there is going to be a hard limit to adaptation. And then it's a good reason to, uh, to go back to mitigation. 
let's let's go and look at the longer term picture as well because some of the messages that i receive on social media and other and, and people that i talk to as well um you know at, at events and things that i go to talk to me about the longer term picture they say we can't just look at like one point from one to one point in time and interpret and extrapolate a lot from it let's have a look at the second graph um which shows us the daily surface air temperature since 1940. so this is the good data record. Sam, can you talk us through this and how would should, should we understand it? It's not an easy graph to understand, but if you basically for beginners like me, the blue bit, that's either before you were born or when you were in a kid. And, then, <laughs> and yeah. then the red bit is sort of now. That's basically it. Yeah. So I, I guess to unpack this graph in a little bit more detail is there's there's a bell curve of global temperatures. And this is because the planet isn't warming equally. So the land area is warming faster than the ocean and there is more land in the northern hemisphere. So the <coughs> peak of the temperature graph occurs when uh, we have the northern hemisphere summer because that's where the majority of the land masses are. So that's the first thing to realize. That's why we have this peak in June, July, August. And then um, the- Yeah, so if the planet was uniformly covered in earth and ocean, then in fact, that would be a flat graph. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So that's why we see that peak in the middle of the year in, in the boreal summer, as we like to call it. So June, July, August. And then we've colored the decades of this figure where blue is the, the longest time ago in the early 1940s or in the 40s. And then it increasingly warms up as the temperatures increase. There's also a gray line along this graph, which is the 1.5 degrees Celsius line. And this reminds everyone of the limit set by the Paris Agreement in 2015 that we need to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees. And we can see from the lines on this graph that we've exceeded that gray line a number of times in the past. But when we look at the really bright red line of 2023, we can see that we're exceeding that line throughout July, throughout August, and then in September, we were really well above the line. So September as a month ended up at 1.75 degrees Celsius above this pre-industrial level. So above the climate that we had in the 1850s to 1900. And, but we had individual days within the month that were up at 1.9 degrees Celsius. So this doesn't mean that we've broken the Paris Agreement because it's a temporary exceedance of this 1.5. But the reality is the more days, the more weeks, the more months we have above 1.5 degrees, the sooner we will exceed the Paris Agreement limit of 1.5 degrees for a longer period of time for 20 years. I look at that graph and it does seem a little bit scary. Um, Zach, how, how, how do you interpret it, especially related to this question of the 1.5 degrees limit that's kind of set in, in stone in the Paris Agreement? Are we all, all really pretty much well beyond that already? Yes, I think when I look at that graph, like I said earlier, I'm reminded of the persistence of the warmth this year. When you looked at the very bright red line, you know, above the other little lines for each single year, you can see that practically since June, we've every single day, the global temperature has been a new record high. And as you can see, there's lots of squiggles. So there's day to day variability, you can think of that like day to day changes in weather. But we can really see how exceptional 2023 has been by being above all those, um, all those previous years. So when I think of, you know, that that marketing line for the 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial, I, I think it's a really good reminder. So like Sam said, you know, we haven't broken the Paris Agreement. That refers to the long-term temperature being above 1.5 degrees Celsius. But having this threshold and breaking the 1.5 more and more days, more and more months is a reminder of how close we actually already are to that set threshold. The other thing that's really been you know, uh, all over my Twitter or X feed for the last few months as well is the situation at the poles, particularly Antarctica, not somewhere any of us visit most of the time, a very long way away. And you can have a tendency to kind of forget about it. But the Antarctic sea ice extent figures people have been telling me about and I've been reading about a lot over the last few months. And I think it's good for everybody to also have a quick look at those because they're a long way from where we live, as Alexandre was saying, you know, sometimes things are in a distant place and you don't necessarily think about them. But let's have a quick look at the Antarctic sea ice 
extent um, where, where we are at the moment. So there's a different kind of graph, different background, but we've got the same kind of anomaly line going on there for 2023. We should normally have a lot of sea ice in Antarctica this time of year, but we don't. But the Antarctic sea ice level is still going up. It's kind of complicated, Sam, isn't it? Yeah, so again, we've got this seasonal or, or annual variation of sea ice shrinking and growing depending on the season. So in the southern hemisphere, in Antarctica, we have the, the sea ice growing at this time of year. It, it has a, its maximum extent in sort of September, October time. And then as the southern hemisphere warms up and moves towards the austral summer, that sea ice melts with increased heat in the atmosphere and increased heat in the ocean. But what we see this year in the curve is that we we started um, the uh, sea ice growing season at a record low, and then is grown much more slowly this year than any previous year. So, that so yes, line, right down on uh, on February on the left hand side, it's sort of already right down low. Their sort of starting point was bad. Exactly, and and what's even worse than that is the starting point for next summer, for the austral summer to come, is much much lower. Um, maximum sea ice extent right. in Antarctica than what we've ever had before. Why is this happening? Do we know? Well, it's a combination of factors, but the reality is uh, with additional heat in the system, it, it makes it easier to, to melt ice on land and ice on the water. And we have additional heat in the atmosphere. We have additional heat in the ocean. Um, and we also know that there's feedback mechanisms from that. So when we have sea ice melting, the, the white surface or the, the bright surface of sea ice is replaced by the dark surface of the ocean. And that absorbs mm. a lot more energy, which creates more of an energy differential between the, the bright uh, white sea ice and the dark ocean. So there's a lot of feedbacks in place. Let's bring up some of the photos we have of Antarctic sea ice, actually, um, because I was kindly sent some of these photos. One we got from the British Antarctic Survey and another from the International Polar Foundation. Um, here we can see that effect that you were talking about, this kind of darkness. Um, it, it, so is that a, a very profound and, and serious problem, actually, this low of Antarctic sea ice that we have at the moment? Or is there a chance if it's just part of variability and things could go back to how they were? So there, there's always a chance of variability. As Zach mentioned, there's these long term trends that are very clear, but then there's within year and between year variability um, across those long term trends. But the, the reality is uh, last year, we also had a record minimum in 2022. And we also saw from the British Antarctic Survey that there was no successful recruitment of emperor penguins in Antarctica. So we mm. know that the sea ice has huge implications for biodiversity, for, for nature. And with this low sea ice, it has massive implications, not only for the physics of the system, which we've been talking about, but also for the biology and the chemistry of the system as well. Zach, um, you're, you're a sea ice um, expert. Um, tell us a little more about what you see happening, unfolding this year. As we've been saying, you know, there are many alarming climate statistics in 2023, but I have to say that the Antarctic sea ice graph, like you just saw there, is one of the weirder ones. And I use weird because that's probably the best word to describe what's going on. So when we talk about climate change, we're very used to talking about the Arctic, so the other pole. So we know that there's been a long-term trend in the loss of Arctic sea ice, and there's been substantial warming. Um, you may have heard of Arctic amplification, which we know that the Arctic is warming a lot faster than the rest of the planet. However, in the Antarctic, which is what the graph we just saw, has been a bit of a different story over the last several decades where we haven't really observed a long-term trend in the amount of sea ice. It stayed essentially flat. And there's various reasons why that has happened in active research ongoing to try to explain why. So then all of a sudden, about since 2016, we started to observe a, tr a difference in the amount of Antarctic sea ice. We started having several years that were particularly low. And then like was mentioned in 2022, we observed the new lowest at the end of the Austral summer, the amount of sea ice. And then we broke that record again this past year. So the big question is, you know, what has changed since 2016? And whether are we finally starting to see the influence of human-caused climate change more clearly emerge 
in the Antarctic? And I think that is the big question that we're all trying to understand. I mean, amongst us and with my colleagues at Euronews, people will say to me, is this El Nino, I'll throw it in your direction, is this El Nino hitting Antarctica? Is that possible? Yes, the El Nino is, a, as we said, you know, it's very important for global temperature, but it's also very important for weather. So what happens is when you have changes in the Pacific Ocean, that affects actually thunderstorms in, in the Pacific Ocean. And those thunderstorms can actually send, we call them atmospheric waves. Essentially, you can think that of as like giant storm systems that go along the jet stream. Again, the jet stream is a sort of a tunnel of wind high in the atmosphere that guides storm systems. So what happens is when you have an El Nino, this can disturb what's normal for the thunderstorms that form in the Pacific Ocean. So that sends off these atmospheric waves, which then affects you know, storm systems. So what might be a consequence that's ongoing right now from this El Nino is that we're seeing a change in the storm systems in the Southern Ocean. And why that's really important is these storm systems can affect wind in the waves, which then affect the formation, you know, the growth or melting of sea ice. So one of the big questions we have is what is sort of the atmosphere drivers? How are these changes in storm systems in the Southern Ocean? How could they be playing a role in addition to the heat that we're talking about, you know, that's growing in the Southern Ocean. And we think it's a combination of these factors that's resulting in the current low sea ice conditions we're observing. Well, have we got enough data for Antarctica? Because there's not, not, not an awful lot of people there um, to, with weather stations. Yes, one of the biggest challenges in, you know, understanding climate change in polar regions, especially in the Antarctic, is the amount of data. So I, I always advocate that we can use more and more data. You know, one area that really would be helpful for us to understand what's going on right now is having more data for the ocean heat. So, you mm. know, having more buoys and stations trying to understand, you know, how much heat we're seeing both at sort of at the surface and deeper in the Southern Ocean. And I think that will tell us, give us a lot more clues to what's going on with the, the changes we're observing in sea ice. Um, before we get on to talking to Alexandre and, and Lucy about adaptation um, and some, the great experiments they've been doing in Paris particularly, I'm very interested in those, and Lucy's going to talk to us about the psychology of, of action. Um, I think it's important to also talk about sea surface temperature, which Zach just mentioned, and let's have a look at the, the graph showing the sea surface temperature anomaly for July 2023. Um, Basically, there's a lot of red and yellow there. What's going on? Um, Zach, would you, would you like to talk us, uh, talk us through this? Sure. You know, we've spent a lot of time focusing on like the global temperature. So, of course, that's the average temperature around the whole planet. But, you know, that metric is useful to understand long term trends and climate change indicators. But what, what it's really sort of hiding is all of the regional variability. So what we're looking at here, like this map, you can look at the changes in the sea surface temperature, the anomalies or deviation from average at all locations. So what you're seeing is that some areas are really warm. You have these hot spot regions. And what's particularly striking about this plot is, like was mentioned, this spatial coverage of how much red you're seeing here. You know, mm -hmm. almost all areas across the Atlantic Ocean are warmer than average. And then if you sort of look on the left-hand side of this map, you can see sort of the edge of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of South America. And you can sort of see this very dark red stripe. And that's referring to this El Nino we've been talking about, which is this amplified warming of the Pacific Ocean. So this combination of this El Nino, you know, the warming in the tropical Pacific combined with the warming all across the Atlantic has really been what's alarming about this year. Why would that be happening, Sam? Why would we start to see these anomalies, the signal being so strong over the oceans? So they, again, uh, as Zach mentioned, the, there's a number of different reasons. Um, and, and the reality is that ocean heat um, has been, well, so the, the ocean absorbs 90% of the excess heat from the atmosphere, from uh, greenhouse gas, uh, emissions and, and fo burning fossil fuels. So the ocean is effectively our climate buffer. 
And the reason why scientists are so concerned is with these uh, very warm temperatures that we're seeing in the ocean. So we've had uh, a record uh, global ocean temperature for August. Um, so August 2023 was the warmest the global ocean has ever been. In addition to that, the North Atlantic Basin, which we can see on the screen now, and the Pacific Basin are warmer than they've ever been before. So mm -hmm. up at, at 25 degrees for um, the, the North Atlantic and up at 21 degrees for the global ocean and the Pacific. And what this means is that the, the ocean is then more more susceptible to having marine heat waves. So just like on land, we can have ocean heat waves and this have has massive consequences, um, again, on biodiversity, but also on um, how it changes weather patterns. So with a warmer ocean, you get more of, well, you get a warmer atmosphere, you get more evaporation. With that increased evaporation, you then get more um, potential uh, energy for storms to build up, which can have implications for things like cyclones and hurricanes. So, so there's a huge impact on uh, ocean temperatures. And we also know the warmer the ocean is, the less efficient the ocean circulation is. So we know that in the North Atlantic, the, the oceanic jet stream, there's a jet stream in the atmosphere and in the ocean that is slowing down due to warmer waters. And we also know that Antarctic circumpolar current, so the, the oceanic current that goes around Antarctica has also slowed down due to ocean warming. Um, when we look to events that are happening right now, like the El Nino, the El Nino event for 2023-24 is starting with a warmer ocean than it's ever had. So from a scientific perspective of understanding where the El Nino will go, how strong an event it will be, how it will connect up with the atmosphere, and how we'll get those teleconnections outside of the Pacific Basin around the west, rest of the world, where mm. scientists really unsure because we've not observed this type of El Nino before, how it will evolve. So we're all watching the data very closely to really understand how this will evolve and what implications it has for weather and for climate trends uh, for 2024 and, of course, for extreme events around the world. I was just going to ask you, is 2024 going to be hotter again then? With all probability, yes. Right. On that note, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? I'm going to bang things out off, off camera. Um, what are we going to do about it? Well, let me start with Lucy because uh, Alexandra has got tons to tell us about, but Lucy's studying action or inaction on climate. At the moment, emissions, the things that are causing this problem, continue to go up on a global level, although they're coming down in Europe. Why are we not doing what we should do? Um, why is the kind of language that we get from the politicians or the messages from the scientists, why are they not getting through? What are the barriers, Lucy? So we know, we've known for a really long time that there is a gap between levels of concern, levels of understanding and action. And we know that um, one of the reasons for this is that it's, it's very difficult for people to feel like they can take action if they don't have a sense of agency. So typically what we have done in the past is we have, um, we've often tried to make people feel afraid of climate change as a way of getting them to take action. And we know that actually that, that doesn't work uh, very well. And, and that's not to say that climate change isn't scary, it is, but, but that in itself won't help people to be able to, to, to do things differently. So we know we know a bit about what happens when people get, get very frightened by something. It's very unreliable in terms of the sort of change in behavior that it creates. So, so what can happen is that they can, um, they can start to feel very paralyzed. Anyone who's been very frightened of something will know that feeling, that feeling of, of feeling like you, you, you can't act, you just don't know what to do. Kind of rabbit in the headlights kind Absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and feeling really like you as an individual can't do anything. And also as an organisation, lots of moving parts. What are we supposed to do? And you get that real action paralysis. We also know another thing that can happen is that people can um, 
can become very, very, uh, very, very, very motivated. So you do get some people who, when they feel frightened, they can make change happen. That that's a real motivating force for them. And you see that in a lot of in a lot of activist groups. That that for them is really working. Um, but but then for other people, they can completely disengage um, and they can kind of start to reject uh, reject the, the information completely and say, you know, this isn't, no, it's not, it's not happening. No, I don't, I don't believe that. Do you so, kind of have like a sense of a percentage, I suppose? I'm thinking of a kind of a pie chart of all of society. The activist is a very small number. Those who sympathise with the activists is probably quite a large number, but there's an awful lot of us who are rabbits in the headlights. And there's, again, a small percentage who are probably, as you say, completely disengaging or trying to kind of deny the whole thing is happening. Absolutely. And and so because there are this, there is this big group of people, and I won't put, put a number on it, but there is a very big group of people who who um, have got that kind of rabbit in the headlights feeling. What we're there to do is to try and help them to, to move beyond that um, and try and help them to, to, to get into a position where they can make change happen. Now, we do know some things that work. And we know that building your own individual sense of agency is really, really important. And so what we want to do is we want to tell people really great stories of the sorts of action that can happen, the sorts of action that they can take that can help them to really understand, OK, this is what I can do and this is what we can do organisationally and help them to get past that feeling of being stuck. But I suppose there's always going to be an economic argument there on an individual level um do i you know if, how, what transport options do i choose for example but then on the scale of a company as well people have got to see a kind of return on their investment in that relatively rapidly haven't they i mean because altruism's also not working is it no absolutely and this is the thing that i find super interesting so i would really um at the climate action unit one of the things that we're always trying to do is to understand for each organization that we're working with, for each group of policymakers, how can we help them to find the thing that is going to work for them? So how are we going to find the thing that is going to make a difference uh, for them? And that's not about persuading them, that's about finding the entry point that they can do things differently. So if it's somebody where there is an economic, uh, there is an economic element, you know, it's actually really more important to try and solve that economic problem in a way that is kind of that, that also is helpful for climate change, rather than flipping it on its head and saying, let's take the climate change action that also is helpful for the economy, which is the way that it's more normally framed. Um, and there's this phrase that you might hear kind of bandied about called co-benefits. But if you if you twist that round and you say, OK, let's find the thing that you need and 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 then go in that way. And some just a, it's not all about personal action. It is about organizational action and policy action as well. But to take a personal example for a moment, um, and I'm, I'm going to give you an example of, of somebody that I know who started to cycle to the station because they were really fed up with paying for the really painful cost of parking their car. So they thought, oh, gosh, I'm going to cycle. I'm going to cycle. And it was purely economic to start with. But after a while of doing that, they started to feel better. They started to feel healthier. And then what they started to do is they started to think, OK, well, this is great for the environment. And they started to tell people, you know, I'm doing this and it's good for the environment. And you know what? Because I can do that, I don't need my car. I've got two cars in our family. I can ride my bike to do all the things that I need to do that are locally. And then oh, we only really need a car sort of when we're uh, when we're when there's um, when we're both going somewhere. So I tell you what, we can get rid of that second car. And it just it's about creating a, a place where you are getting people to do something differently and then allowing them to understand, OK, that means that I can do something. And we describe that in the Climate Action Unit as, as actions drive beliefs. And it's something mm. that we all experience, but it's it's kind of counterintuitive. More commonly, we think that beliefs drive actions. But in practice, in our everyday lives, it's usually the other way around. That's really interesting. And as a keen cyclist myself, I can I can really engage with that one. And also an important point that you missed is that if you ride your bike a lot every day, you can eat more cake. And eating more <laughs> cake is a good thing. Um, um, let me go to Alexandre. You have been doing the most extraordinary test in uh, Paris. Can you just explain to us briefly what you did 
on Friday last week when you were taking these children underground into a disused railway tunnel. Um, an unusual thing to do, but amazing pictures. Talk us through it. We'll show some of the pictures from the experiment, but uh, tell us what did you do? Yes, yeah, so last Friday, uh, the city of Paris organized uh, um, a simulation of um, how we would have to react to a uh, heat dome hitting Paris. Um, um, it was placed in 2032, um, and um, we've role played uh, with children, but also with uh, elderly people, um, people working with uh, uh, homelesses, and 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 so on. Um, it was mainly focused on uh, on publics which are um, more keen to suffer from heat waves, and um, basically. Um, we wanted to show them how could life be uh, during a during a major uh, um, heat wave. Um, the images in, are in this, cool. In this photo, you, you basically got the kids down in a tunnel because I mean, how much cooler would it be down there in practical terms? How, how much do you do you save if it's twenty if it's twenty thirty two and it's fifty degrees outside? How much cooler is it in the tunnel? Well, it usually do not go above 20 degrees uh, within the tunnel. Um, um, I, we don't have uh, very um, uh, specific measures and also it depends on how long the heat wave is going to last. Um, but I've been advocating for the last three years that we should look at uh, all the places in Paris which are naturally cool. Uh, here is an example with the tunnel. Uh, we also have uh, networks of uh, uh, um, catacombs, places where we used to uh, to to carve for uh, stones also, and I want to investigate that as well. Um, mm -hmm. But we we are talking also about um, um, churches uh, and how to use them uh, during uh, uh, these sort of times. And as well, we need to investigate what we're going to do with the places which already have uh, air conditioning. Uh, in Paris, most of the people do not have air conditioners uh, at their uh, home, but we do have them uh, in, the, uh, in the offices, in the museums, and in the hotels. So are we going to share those spaces so that uh, most of the people have some sort of access to it, or is it going to stay uh, private or um, um, and mostly for uh, richer people? Uh, yeah, I was going to say there's an element of answer. fairness. There's an element of fairness here, right? So, I mean, you're talking about requisitioning air-conditioned areas when you get to a peak of heat dome and you say everybody needs to have access to these places. Uh -huh. Well, if it was up to me, we would just start the conversation now. And if we need to requisition, then yeah, we'll, we, I would do it. But right. I'm not in charge. I don't have this power uh, yet. That's a, 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 a non, not even the mayor has this power. It's the state's uh, power if we need to go uh, uh, that uh, far away. And um, um, because if you really, if you look at temperature as a common good, it's being privatized at the moment. Um, and um, we, 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 we need to talk about climate uh, social justice uh, um, yeah. uh, as well. Uh, how realistic, one of the clim climate scientists can tell me, how realistic is 50 degree heat dome conditions in August in 2032 in Paris? Samuel Zach? It's, it's really hard to say, but I think given that we've had 49 degrees in British Columbia two years ago, and British Columbia was at, is at a similar latitude to, to Paris, it's that was a really surprising heat dome event for many climate scientists. That it was very well forecast, um, but we weren't expecting that level of heat wave uh, in 2021. So it's certainly possible, um, but extreme events are incredibly hard to predict um a, a decade out um lucy can what, what do you how do you read these experiments in paris is this what big cities should be doing i i, I mean i can i just say how much i absolutely love this experiment and the reason that i love it is not just 
as um, as an experiment to see what might happen is because for the organizations involved, what it's allowing them to do is it's allowing them to experiment with what it means for them and to really place themselves in these uh, in this the, these situations. So what they get a chance to do is they get a chance to actually exercise the agency that they currently have. And they get a chance to really understand, OK, these are the things we can do. This is the way that we can deploy our skill set and our capabilities. And 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 uh, before we started, I, I hope you don't mind me, me saying this, but Alexandra mentioned it. It also helps them to to understand the limits of where they can currently mm. Uh, where they currently have kept those capabilities. And for me, that's super important because what that tells me is that tells me it's allowing them to under understand where the gaps are. And what I really am hoping, and I'm hoping, Alexandra, you can tell me a little bit about this, is, is what, what you can then do to support those organisations to understand how to fill those gaps. And through that support of how to fill those gaps, then we hopefully will start to see those those organizations build their capabilities so that they can respond to situations and understand what what is possible. Alexandre, uh, go ahead. Tell us about what you found. Then, what what are the blocks? I suppose. Wow, so many so many things happened. Um, first of all, I think uh, for most participants, there was a discovery that it was much bigger and frightening than than they would expect just by uh, thinking about it for uh, a few minutes, you know. Uh, it was uh, an involvement uh, uh, counted in days uh, in terms of preparation. It was a whole day on Friday, and it was a few hours also on Tuesday uh, in a, a crisis management room only for uh, the, the public services this time, not with children uh, or elderly people. Um, there are many um, among the things that I've noticed uh, so far is that there was this wow, this aha moment uh, that all of them, most of them had. And I've noticed also that it was not completely realistic in my understanding. Just I'll give you one example. Air conditioning have uh, um, a limit in terms of temperature until which they can work. And I found out that the, most of the, air, uh, the ACs in Paris are designed to work until 42, 43 degrees. So if you have a heat dome above this temperature, you might have ACs uh, which stop working. And it was, not, um, uh, it was not one of the hypotheses made uh, during the game. However, I think people were not prepared to to this eventuality, they, they, it's like they were not able to conceive that our technical sphere could fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, although and, it, it's very well in, in, in your simulation, you were also talking about things like um, the, you know, the, the transport systems not working because the railway lines got too hot and so they were buckled. You had workers who said they couldn't work because it was too hot. You've got other systems kind of collapsing as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, it's both a problem for humans and also other uh, um, uh, other livings. Uh, we usually do not talk about trees in in this context, but uh, if if they stop uh, evapotranspirating, it means that the 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 local temperature is going to increase drastically, very rapidly. Um, um, there, there was a whole lot of uh, technical systems that were uh, uh, falling apart in this in the simulation, and I think this is very realistic. Um, and all of this, um, um, Lucy, I completely understand your point in saying that uh, people do not necessarily most of the people do not act upon a threat. Uh, however, um, so it, I, 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 my understanding, we need to have both. It's like understanding better what the, the threat is and discussing about uh, the solutions that you have when the threat is going to come and also beforehand. And something that drastically changed thanks to all this Paris at 50 degrees uh, initiative uh, and the simulation is part, is, 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 uh, is one aspect of, of it, um, is that we finally had a discussion in Paris regarding tourism. Because 
I was making the case, I was advocating, advocating for the last three years that most of our footprint is in Paris is linked to airborne tourism. We need to look at it. We need to reduce it. We need to um, prepare the sector in terms of uh, a job transformation. And it was um, there was no possible discussion for the last three years. And finally, in May, Paris, which is, let me remind you this, the first uh, touristical destination in the world, uh, we, we voted to advocate uh, with the, to the government to decrease the amount of uh, flights going in and out in the Paris region. It's a huge move, and this is uh, essential when you're talking about uh, uh, degrowth, actually, because this is the only path we have to go through in order to, uh, um, to diminish as much as possible uh, the, the the problem we we we, we are facing and Lucy, work on adaptation Lucy, as well. Lucy, can I bring you in? You look like you're desperate to say something. Yeah, sorry. No, there was um and and um, but I think I just want to come back to something that you said because I think you made a really really important point that I I absolutely um want want us to kind of to to kind of explore a little bit more if possible, which is that there is a distinction between um fear and threat. And I think um, I absolutely agree with you that, that understanding threats is very, very important. So when I was talking about fear, what I was talking about was a more generalized sense of being afraid of mm. climate change and knowing that you need to act. But when we talk about threats, we're talking about something different. We're talking about risk and about understanding risk. Um, and something that we find very useful to think about at the CAU is understanding the, the currency of risk um, for the, 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 the thing that you are working in. And that's about translating climate risk information into what it means specifically for your system, for your transport system, for your, um, for your individual kind of working practices. And, and what that means then is, yes, it might be scary, but it's a, it's a place where you can start to look at, okay, how can we start to change particular practices? And the distinction that I would make there is different types of risk information. So the big scary headline about um, what is happening with climate change, which I would just say is extremely important, we need to know that information, um, is, is really there to storytell. It's about storytelling the risk of climate change at the headline level, what it means for, for the world. But then there is risk for decision making. And what you have been introducing, or at least my understanding of, of this, in the, the Paris at 50 degrees um, exercises is, is risk for stories, uh, risk for decision making information. So you have been giving people a lived experience, not, not a model, a lived experience of what that risk looks and feels like, which enables them to, and, and it might not feel like they're enabled at the moment to make decisions about what that means, but it, it puts them in a place where they can start to think about what that means. But again, and I, I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record, but for me, the thing that's really important is actually how you support those organizations from here, from this moment, towards being able to make change happen and to building that capability. Because we know that scary things can actually be, you know, we can tackle them when we feel like we have a concrete action that we need to take, when we feel like it's something that is meaningful, that we are empowered to do something that is, is meaningful in that situation. Um, and, and that it is actionable it is a step that we can take. So for those people who felt completely out of their depth on Friday and Tuesday, um, and they felt like they didn't know what to do. It's about them building back that capability. So from yeah. where they are at the moment to where they know that they can take action. No, that's a, that's a good point. And um, uh, let me just bring up actually something I wanted to share from, from another TV channel, not something that we do often as journalists, but um, uh, French television actually did a, a simulation of what the weather forecast would be like in August 2050, again, as part of an effort to try and kind of raise awareness and, and to encourage debate. Although having looked at this, which is a revised upwards from a, from a previous one, it doesn't look so different from the 2023 summer that I just lived through. Um, Zach, when you look at a uh, weather forecast like that, this, these kinds of temperatures were hitting Texas this year, weren't they? I mean, th th and these are unlivably hot temperatures for, for a lot of people. Um, I, 
what do you think about what you're hearing here as, as a climate scientist? You know, you're at the academic end of this, but you've got 64,000 followers on Twitter and everybody follow Zach on Twitter. He's great. Where do we take it from here? Yes, absolutely. So one of the most active areas of climate science research right now is understanding these extreme events. Like was mentioned before, I think many climate scientists were somewhat caught off guard by the heat wave that hit southwestern Canada and the northwestern United States, um, the Pacific Northwest heat wave, and just the magnitude of the heat in that region. So I think one area you're going to see a lot more research coming up is in understanding these extreme events. Like you mentioned, you know, looking at that weather map, it, it actually doesn't look that very different than what's happening right now, mm. telling us that we really need to understand, you know, how extreme events are going to change in a cha you know, a warming world. Um, one area, you know, bringing it back to what's already been discussed with this, this experiment, Paris at 50 degrees, is one area that's really growing in climate science right now is the idea of climate services. So really for climate scientists to produce products that are really driven for the community level to understand mm -hmm. how extreme events are going to impact these regions. So I think we're going to be hearing a lot more of how climate scientists can work together with people who are experts in adaptation and policy and deliver these, quote, climate services, you know, provide mm -hmm. the data that's in a more understandable way where action can be taken. Um, Sam, that's very much what you're at the sort of cult face of doing. Yeah, very much so. And I think that there's a couple of points that I'd like to reflect on at this point. Um, so one was the the heat wave that uh, impacted the, the UK in 2021, where the UK, um, some uh, weather stations uh, observed over 40 degrees, and that beat records by four degrees. So again, the expectation that the UK could hit 40 degrees in, in 2022 was really unheard of uh, until it happened. And I think one of the things that's really fascinating uh, about hearing about Alexander's experiment is enabling people to understand the risk that they're facing right now, that they, they've been exposed to their entire life, but probably haven't observed it. So when we look at heat waves, and if we stay with the Paris example, I from most people's lived experience, the biggest uh, fatality or mortality rate from heat waves was in the, the heat waves of 2003. Mm -hmm. When we compare, particularly in France, in, in regional France, and if we compare the 2003 heat waves that impacted France, the UK and, and the surrounding region, uh, the heat waves that we had in, in 2019, 2020, 2021 and 2022 were much, much warmer and more extensive than the heat waves that we've had in, in 2003, but we lost a lot less lives. And that's because in the interim, um, the decision makers and, and policy has built in better planning processes to be informed by the weather and adapt accordingly to protect the most vulnerable when we have these heat wave events. And we know from the climate science that with a warmer world, we will experience more extreme events, we will experience more heat waves. So adapting and preventing the most vulnerable uh, being impacted by these heat waves are really critical. And I really loved Alexander's example of, you know, the air conditioners would cut out well before the experiment and, and no one had really appreciated that. So the the mm. whole, you know, uh, rescue Experiment. line of we we can just use energy to create an artificial environment, that, that's flawed reality because the, the machines aren't viable for the weather conditions that they would be exposed to. I'm going to have to start moving into my cellar. Um, the, I just want to quickly run through some of the questions that we've had from people watching. Thank you for those. Um, um, they range enormously. Ah, Alexandra, you'll like this one. What's the what's the current part of the Paris City Council budget that's allocated to climate adaptation? Hmm. How much money do you have for climate adaptation? Um, I don't know the number, uh, but this is how I will uh, judge um, uh, the the mayor um, in how serious uh, we are when it comes to adaptation because Paris at 50 degrees uh, is now used as a gimmick uh, by uh, a lot a lot of politicians in Paris um, but we'll have to have discussions regarding the budget by the end of the year and 
and it might conflict with organizing the Olympic Games uh, in mm. summer 2024. Um, and yeah. um, we will see we'll see how it goes in terms of discussing uh, the budget. And also, I will be very very cautious uh, cautiously looking into uh, the kind of um, um, budgeting we will do. <clears throat> what I mean by that is that. Are we going to finance our own adaptation by polluting somewhere else, depending mm. on uh, airborne tourism or you know displacing our own uh, pollutions, or are we uh, actually going to do both mitigation and adaptation? Um, because if if Paris is the only city in France uh, or or in Ile de France uh, which is adapted, uh, it's not going to solve our problem. No. Uh, we need to have a way to do so without uh, polluting at the same time. Um, so, the, what the, one of the yeah. other questions we got, which kind of plays into that, is how could nature restoration be included in climate adaptation in cities? Um, uh, Lucy, maybe you can bring you in on that one. Nature restoration, obviously, we know planting trees is helpful, um, although at a certain point they give up their ev evapotranspiration, as Alexander was, was talking about. So I'm not I'm not an expert in nature based solutions, but one thing that I would say is that we know that we need a whole variety of different solutions to come together. So all of these different types of solutions have a role to play in adaptation and mitigation. Um, and so we know that we need we need all of them. And, and just to, to Alexandra's point uh, previously, and this sort of brings together those those two questions, one of the things that we we know is that that actually whole departments, whole government, the, the whole government departments need to be enabled. They need to be helped to think differently about how they can meet their other objectives in a way that also adapts to climate change. So that the decisions that they're making are bringing in adaptation and mitigation decisions. Because whilst we find ourselves in a position where you have a small group of people who are responsible for climate change adaptation or a small proportion of the budget, then it's a, it's a strange way of thinking about it because mm. actually you can be much, much more powerful if it's, if it, if it's part of you know, understanding how you meet the, the, your other development goals, your other change goals, whatever they may be. And it means really fundamentally shifting away from the mindset that that climate change is always going to create a cost. Right. And in some instances, yeah. it can be about making decisions where you bring in adaptation decisions. And they they are, and this is back to this idea, that they that you can meet your goals in a way that is um that 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 also kind of brings in brings in climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation. Sorry, I didn't articulate. No, um, it's okay. No, another question we got in, uh, which I guess is looking forward to COP twenty eight. Do you think we can actually manage to get a real ban on fossil fuels soon? Has anybody got a particular view on that? Um, I suppose Alexander's the only one who's in a political post. Do you think it's a it's a, any possibility of getting that ban? soon it's going to have to happen at a certain point alexander i don't believe in cops anymore i mean it's um it's uh, i think it's a lack of it's a it's a waste of time and energy um we are as, as soon as um I, i'm really uh, um, thinking into this as a, a politician in paris as a french uh, man uh, as a european citizen and um the things that we need we would need to do is simplify our lives uh as much as much as possible and then maybe we will both be more uh, heard and coherent uh in international discussions um uh, we would uh, i would love uh, the french gov for the french government to stop subsiding uh and protecting total who has uh, uh again um petroleum and gas projects um so at, as I mean, if we're not able to do this uh, as European countries, why would the others do it? Let's bring up quickly our last graph, actually, that um, we have, which shows the, the climate action tracker. And um, uh, Sam, perhaps maybe you can talk to us a little bit about uh, what we can see here and also what, what your expectations might be for the cops to come. Alexander says he doesn't believe in them. Um, I don't know what your view is. 
Well, I think they're a really important process, but the, the reality is we're um, a, a two months away from COP28 and, and the action that we've seen from all the previous COPs hasn't been what the planet needs. So when we look at this graph, um, it, it's got time uh, along the, the bottom axis and the uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. And in the black line, you can see that global greenhouse gas emissions have been largely increasing through time since 1990 levels. And then you can see uh, a blue band and a green band. And the blue band, uh, or there's two different colors of blue bands. One is um, the policies and actions, so where this will take us to. And the lighter blue band is the pledges and targets that have been committed at, at previous COPs. And the reality is that the, the difference between the blue and the green is the target gap and the implementation gap between what politicians have committed to on paper versus what we really need to happen to get to net zero by 2050 and to keep the planet compatible with the Paris Agreement limit of 1.5 degrees. It's a big gap. We will, it's an enormous we will be gap. We will be talking a lot about that gap in the in the weeks to come, I'm sure, as COP comes around. Um, Zach, a final word from you. 2024, what can we expect from our climate? Are you going to be giving us more and more kind of astounding records, do you think? Is that your expectation? Yes, unfortunately, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of this types of graphics we've been looking at today with more striking climate records Given that the El Nino is expected to continue through the boreal winter, at least the early part of it, I think we're going to see a lot more global warmth um, in, in pushing perhaps another record warm year. Um, so I think you'll be hearing a lot more about extreme events in the upcoming year. Right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this Climate Now Live here on Euronews YouTube channel. It's been a real pleasure talking to everybody and a fascinating, I think, to have these two worlds come together of the climate scientists and also those specialists in adaptation, those amazing examples that we talked about and what the barriers are to change. So um, please head over to euronews.com slash climate now where you can see my regular reports on how our planet is changing with the facts from the Copernicus Climate Change Service. And I'll say thank you to Samantha Burgess, the Deputy Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service for being with us. Thank you, Sam. Thank you to Zachary Labour, climate scientist at Princeton University. Marvelous to have you with us. Lucy Hubble-Rose from the UCL Climate Action Unit. Brilliant to have you on the panel and Alexandre Florentin. Uh, Green Party MEP and President of Paris at 50 Degrees. Thanks for being with us in this conversation. Send us your comments using the hashtag climate now and head over to euronews.com for world news from a European perspective. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>